This is the second part uh, of our read through a very provocative piece uh, by Rogers Brubaker and Frederick Cooper, and it's called Beyond Identity. Identity is a word that is used a lot uh, by journalists. Um, we talk about identity politics, identity crisis, and sometimes when we get a tool, we use a tool, after a while it becomes very blunt. The more people who use it, the blunter it gets. And so uh, Brubaker and Cooper are wanting to go beyond this word identity, and they made some other selections, some other suggestions, sorry, uh, they suggested the use of talking about identifications, categorization, commonality, collectivity. And so um, we're now to the stage where we are going to be looking, we're on page 21, and we're going to be looking, and I won't look at all of them because we won't have time, but it has some examples of, um, of some, it has three case studies of, um, of identity and its alternatives. And some of these case studies, I think, are, are very interesting. And some of them are very relevant to the uh, contemporary context. So um, they've surveyed the work done by identity, and they've indicated limitations and liabilities of the term, and have suggested a range of alternatives. And so now they're wanting to illustrate our argument um, through considering three case studies. And in each of these, uh, they suggest that the I, I, identitary focus on bonded groupness uh, limits the sociology and the political imagination, while alternative analytical idioms can help open them up. So the first example is a, based on a very, very famous study by a British anthropologist hmm, about a decade after Malinowski that you'll be familiar with, um, and it's the Nua. The argument that ethnic groups are not primordial but the products of history, including the re reifying of cultural difference through imposed colonial identifications, uh, becomes a staple in African studies. Even so, uh, scholars tend to emphasize boundary formation rather than boundary crossing, the constitution of groups rather than the development of networks. The constitution of groups rather than the development of networks. And so um, um, he has some information about the Nua. And he makes this comment, in recent work in African history offers a more nuanced approach. The genealogical construction of re relationality offers possibilities of extension more, uh, more um, subtle than the 20th century scholars' tendency to look at neat boundaries between inside and outside. So... Um, marriage relations could extend beyond the Nua, um, uh, and strangers who are encountered while trading, traveling, uh, migration, or other forms of movement can be incorporated as a uh, fictive kin or more loosely linked uh, to the patrilineal, to a patrilineal via blood brotherhood. In many parts of Africa, one finds certain organizations, uh, religious shrines, initiation societies that cross linguistic and cultural distinctions, offering more um, what Paul Richards calls a common grammar of social experience within regions for all the cultural variation and political differentiation that they may contain. The problem with subsuming these forms of relational connectedness under the social construction of identity is that linking and separating get called by the same name. Let's do that again. The problem with uh, subsuming 
forms of relational connection under the social construction of identity is that linking and separating um, get called by the same name, making it harder to grasp the process, causes and consequence of differing patterns of crystallizing difference and forging connections. Let's, let's go into full screen now um, as, we, as we move on. Um, Brubaker makes another point. Um, these imposed identifications can be powerful, but their effects depended on the actual relationship and symbolic systems that colonial officials had to work with and on countervailing efforts to, uh, of others to maintain, develop and articulate different forms of affinities and self-understandings. The colonial era did indeed witness complex struggles over identification, but it flattens our understanding of these struggles to see them as producing identities. It flattens them when we see them in terms purely as identities. To explain present or past conflict in terms of how people construct or fight their identities risks providing a prefabricated a prisonist teleological explanation that diverts attention from questions, other important questions are addressed by Hutchinson. There are some interesting um, other examples that Brubaker used. We have argued that the language of identity with its connotations of boundedness, groupness and sameness are conspicuously ill-suited of analysing segmentary lineage society or a present-day conflicts in Africa. But, there, but we are not arguing only that the concept of identity does not travel well, that it cannot be universally applied to all settings. We want to make a strong argument that identity is neither necessary nor helpful as a category of analysis, even where it is widely used as a category of practice. Many commentators have seen, have seen the post-communist resurgence of ethnic nationalism in the region as springing from robust, deeply rooted national identities, from identities strong and resilient enough to have survived decades of repression by ruthless anti-communist regions, regimes, sorry. Although anti-nationalist and, of course, brutally repressive, repressive the Soviet Union, however, was, was anything but anti-national. It didn't suppress nationhood. The region went to unprecedented lengths in institutionalizing and codifying, uh, codifying nationalities. It carved up the Soviet region into over 50... Um, autonomous national homelands, each belonging to a particular ethno-religious group. It assigned each citizen an ethnic nationality, which was ascribed at birth on the basis of descent, registered in personal identity papers, recorded in bureaucratic encounters, and used to control access to higher education and employment. So doing, the Soviet regime was not simply recognizing or ratifying a pre-existent pre state of affairs. It was now newly constituting both persons and places as national. Consider the case of Russians in Ukraine. Now this is of tremendous contemporary importance after the annexation of Crimea in, in Ukraine by the Russians and the Russian insurgency in eastern Ukraine. The very categories Russian and Ukrainian as designations of, of punitively distinct ethno-cultural nationalities or distinct identities are highly problematic in Ukraine, where rates of intermarriage have been high and where millions of nominal Ukrainians speak only or primarily Russian. 
one should be skeptical of the illusion of identity or bonded groupness created by the census and its with its exhaustive and mutually exclusive categories. One can imagine can imagine circumstances in which groupness might emerge amongst nominal Russians in Ukraine, but groupness cannot be taken as a given. To the extent to which official categorization categorization shapes self-understandings, the extent to which the population categories constituted by, state, uh, by states or political entrepreneurs approximate real groups. These are open questions that can only be addressed empirically. And so and by empirically we go and see what people are actually doing, first hand data. Um, even in its constructivist guise, the idea language of identity disposes, uh, disposes us to think in terms of bonded groups. It does so because even constructivist thinking on, of, on identity takes the existence of identity as axiomatic. Identity is always, is always already there as something that individuals and groups have even if the content of particular identities and the boundaries that mark groups off from each other are conceptualized as always in flux or changing. Even constructivist language tends therefore to be ob to objectify identity, to treat it as a thing, albeit a malleable one that people have, forge, or construct. Furthermore, in the context of um, the United States, um, the third case study, Rogers Brubaker comments, the language of identity has been particularly powerful in the United States. It has been pre preeminent both as an idiom of analysis and social science and as an idiom in which to articulate experience, mobilize loyalty, formulate symbolic and material claims in everyday social and political practice. And we have talked a bit about this in previous lectures. Constructivist arguments have had a particular influence in Americanist circles, allowing scholars to stress the contemporary importance of imposed identifications and the self-understanding uh, understandings that have evolved in dialogical interplay with them, while emphasizing that such self and other identified groups are not primordial but historically produced. The treatment of race in the United States is an excellent example. Even before social construction became a buzzword, scholars were showing that far from being a given a dimension of America's past, race was a political category originating in, in the same movement as Americans' Republican and populist impulses. In the early, in early 19th century Virginia, white indentured servants and black slaves shared a subordination that was not sharply differentiated. They sometimes acted together. So this is the reason why we need to be reading history. Whiteness and blackness were both historically created and historically variable categories. Comparative historians sometimes have shown that the construction of race can take some more varied forms, showing that many people who were black under North American cl classification systems would have been something else in other parts of the Americas, such as Brazil, for example. American histories thus reveal the power of imposed identifications that also reveal the complexity of self understanding of people defined by circumstances not in their control. 
The assignment of individuals to identities leaves many people who have experienced uneven trajectories of ancestry and the variety of innovations and ad- ad- adaptations that constitute culture caught between a hard identity that doesn't fit and a soft rhetoric of hybridity, multiplicity and fluidity that offers neither understanding nor solace. If the real contribution of constructivist social analysis is to be taken seriously and not reduced to a presentist, teleological account of the construction of currently existing groups, then bonded groupness must be understood as a contingent emergent property, not an axiomatic given. Representing contemporary American society poses a similar problem. Thus, this conceptual and conceptually impoverished identitary sociology in which the intersection of race, class, gender, sexual orientation um, has become powerful in American academia in the 1990s, not only in the social sciences, cultural studies and ethnic studies, but also literature and philosophy. The problem with much contemporary political theory is that it is built on questionable sociology. Indeed, precisely on the ground group-centered representation of the social world just mentioned, we are not taking the side of universality against particularity. Rather, we are suggesting that the identitary language and group of social ontology that informs much political theory um, occludes the problematic nature of groupness itself and forecloses other ways of conceptualizing particular affinities and affiliations. What constitutes the the groupness of these groups? What makes them groups rather than categories around which self and other identifications may, but certainly uh, may, but certainly do not necessarily always crystallize? Social and cultural heterogeneity is constructed here as a juxtaposition of internally homogeneous, externally bounded blocks. The principles of unit um, that Young repudiates at the level of the polity as a whole, because they hide difference, are reintroduced and continue to hide difference at the level of the constituent groups. Activists of identity politics, they employ the language of bonded groupness not because it reflects social reality, but because groupness is ambiguous and contested. Their groupist rhetoric has a performative, a constitutive dimension contributing when it is successful to the making of the groups it invokes. Here we have a gap between the normative arguments and the activist idioms that take bounded groupness, uh, groupness as axiomatic and historically and sociological so, and historical and social sociological analyses that emphasize contingency, fluidity, and variability. At one point, there is a real-life dilemma. Preserving cultural distinctiveness depends at least in part on maintaining bonded groupness, hence in policing the exit option and accusations of passing and betraying one roots serve as modes of discipline. But group of sociology that underlines this particular form of coalition politics with its assumption that bonded groups are the basic building blocks of political alliances constricts the biblical imagination. Our point is that identification focus on bonded groups does not help in posing these questions. The debate is in some respects based on misconceptions on both sides. And so in, his conclu- in their conclusion, 
uh, it's worth reading. We do not, we have not made an argument about identity politics. Nevertheless, the argument does have political implications. In some circles, these will be thought of as regressive to undermine the basis of making particularist claims. That is neither our intention nor um, a valid inference of what we've written. To persuade people that they are one, that they comprise a bonded, distinctive group, that they in that their internal differences don't matter, at least for the purposes at hand, this is a normal and necessary part of politics. And not only of what is ordinarily classified and characterised as identity politics. It is not all of politics, and we do not indeed have reservations about the way in which the routine recourse to identitary uh, framing may foreclose other equally important ways of framing political uh, political claims. But we do not seek to deprive anyone of identity as a political tool or to underline the legitimacy of making political appeals um, in terms of identity. Our argument has focused on the use of identity as an analytical concept. Throughout this article we have asked what the work, the concept is supposed to do and how well it does it. We have argued that the concept is deployed to do a great deal of analytical work, much of it legitimate and important. Identity, however, is ill-suited to perform this work, for it is riddled with ambiguity, riven with... Uh, contradictory meanings and encumbered by reifying connotations, qualifying the noun with adjectives such as multiple, fluid, constantly renegotiating, does not solve the problem of the entrapment of a word. It yields little more than a suggestive oxymoron, a multiple singularity, a fluid crystallization but still begs the question of why one should use the same term to designate all this and more. At, the, at issue here is not the legitimacy or importance of particular claims, but how best to conceptualise them. People everywhere and always have particular ties, self-understanding, stories, trajectories, histories, predicaments. And these inform the sorts of claims they make. To subsume such persuasive particularity under the flat, undifferentiated rubric of identity does nearly as much violence as its unruly uh, forms as it would not attempt to subsume it under universal categories such as interest. It is time now to go beyond identity, not in the name or an imagined universalism, but in the name of a conceptual clarity required for social analysis and political understanding alike. Okay, so let's go out of full screen now. Yes, 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 that was difficult. So um, this is provocative. Whenever we read something which questions the words that we use to understand the world that we see, uh, many, when anyone says to you, when you are doing work with a tool which is old and blunt, especially when this is the only tool you have, when someone comes and looks at the only tool you have ever had and says to you, that tool is old, that tool is blunt. No one likes to be told those things. But there's more going on here. We are not only saying that we need to be careful about the words we use and we need to question whether the words we use are doing the, uh, the right tools for us 
to be making sense of the world uh, that we are trying to analyse. But um, there are, it's, it's, the idea is that we are not only saying what's wrong with the present tools that you have, they're old, they're blunt, but we are actively going out of our way to provide alternatives. And one cannot emphasize the importance of using the right words when we are doing conceptual work. It's like a photographer using the right lens. It's like the artist using the right brush and the right paint. And I could go on and on in terms of analogies. So this has been a heavy session. And I encourage you to wrestle with Rogers Brubaker. Um, you, all the stuff is on the Google Drive. There are a number of lectures by him. And he has got a lot to say about many ethnic issues. Stay tuned. We'll see you again.